All right, well, let's go ahead and jump into it. I've got Matthew Bertry here from NMHC to give us an update. How are you doing, Matt? Good. How's it going, Wes? Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Awesome. Um, no, it's a beautiful afternoon here in uh, Washington, D.C., so or I guess Alexandria. Glad to be uh, here with you. How's, how's everything going? Doing great and looking forward to, uh, to meeting everyone at the conference in Miami coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, likewise. We're, we're super excited about it. Well, if you want to, and I'll just put up a poll question for everybody. If you plan on attending uh, NMHC uh, this, um, that's in two weeks, uh, we'd love to see, you know, who's, who's coming, who's not this year, and maybe if someone's still considering it. So, um, and I'll publish that poll when we're done here. Matthew, we'll go ahead and jump into it. Sure. No, th and thanks again for having, having us. Um, so since we last met, um, the Congress uh, did pass what's known as the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. And what's important about that piece of legislation is really almost not what it didn't include rather than what it did include, although it included a couple of provisions that we'll, we'll go over here in just a second. Um, but what it didn't include was a, a sharp increase in carried interest. When the bill came out, uh, what the Congress wanted to do was increase the carried interest holding period for real estate uh, to three years. Right now it's one year because uh, really real estate carried interest is sort of excluded from the provision, but they wanted to bring in real estate into carried interest and have a three-year holding period. So at NMHC, uh, we thought that would be really, really uh, detrimental uh, to the multifamily and student housing industries, uh, particularly from the production perspective. Um, so, so we got to work um, and we were able to um, eliminate work with others to eliminate that provision um, from the final legislation. Um, in addition to that, one of the other provisions that was being floated that was not included that I think we've talked about in the past um, would have um, imposed a 3.8% tax on um, active um, investment income. So right now under current law, if you um, in your personal account own Microsoft stock and you're of a certain income level, when you sell that stock, you not only pay a capital gains uh, tax on it, but also pay a 3.8% net investment income tax on that passive income. What the, what the proposal wanted to do that they floated was to put that 3.8% tax on active income, uh, which again would have just um, decreased the amount of capital that the industry uh, would have to put up new student housing. So bottom line is there's no, there's no expansion of the net investment income tax and there's no uh, expansion of carried interest, both of which I think are really big victories for the student housing industry. Um, what, the, what the proposal does include is it does include some nice energy efficiency um, deductions and credits um, that folks might want to take a look at that you can look at it on our website. Um, but really, the bill is characterized by what it didn't include. So looking ahead to um, what Congress is doing right now, uh, they need to, before breaking for the elections, pass a um, resolution that will fund the government through December. Um, so that there's no government shutdown before they go home and campaign. Then they come back um, and it's possible that they will do another tax bill when they come back. We don't expect revenue raisers to be a huge part of that. But what really we're looking out for from the student housing perspective is uh, right now under current law, um, you get a, what's known as 100 percent bonus depreciation for all the good stuff that you put inside your buildings. And what that means in plain English is that you can immediately expense or write off uh, things that you put inside um, student housing buildings from furniture uh, and the like. Um, next year, that 100% bonus depreciation phases down to 80%, and we would like to see it uh, extended at 100% uh, going forward. So that's one thing we'll be looking for, looking at going uh, in the lame duck session of Congress. Um, so with that, I'll stop, um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, and we will also, for those um, attending the um, student housing conference in a couple of weeks, we will have a full government affairs panel where, we'll, where we will delve into these uh, and other issues in, uh, in in great detail. But great to be here with you. Happy to take some questions, if any. Great. Yeah, I don't I don't see any questions coming up just okay. yet. But if um, if anybody does, uh, Matt will be around. He can he can also answer that in the in the chat area as well. Yeah. Um, well, Matthew, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks down in South Beach. Great. Thanks, Wes. All right. Well, guys, next, I want to bring up uh, Richard from CORE. Richie, hold on just a second. Let me get your slides up. Can you hear us? Yep. Can you hear me? Awesome. Perfect. I can hear you. Great. Um, let me pull your slides up. 
So uh, for those that don't know Richie, he is um, – oh, Rich, give, give a little bit of background on yourself with CORE, and then um, we'll talk a little bit more about what you're, what you're going to be talking about today as it relates to the Mental Wellness Coalition. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, so I'm director of innovation, engagement, core spaces. Uh, mental health has been something that you know I've been personally passionate about, and uh, I got connected to the coalition um, after Jen Cassidy reached out to uh, us, Peak and ACC, uh, so to kind of take a step back. You know, the history of the coalition. Uh, this is December 2021, and uh, Jen reached out to that small group and said, like, Hey, you know, back in spring of 2020. We came together as an industry and we figured out how to operate student housing, figure out how to financially support ourselves um, and weather the storm of COVID, right? Uh, fast forward a year and a half later, I don't need to go through all the, you know, the history of how mental health through COVID has you know, spiked in terms of incidents. But Jen was like, look, me at Cardinal, I'm seeing in my communities, I'm seeing increasing mental health incidents. I'm seeing increasing crime rate. I'm seeing increase in uh, suicides. And she's like, I know we're not the only ones. And so, you know, she reached out to say, hey, let's let's come together again and uh, let's figure this out together and not work in silos. And so I know you asked about my history, Wes. Uh, basically, I've been working at CORE on our mental health initiatives. So it was so great, you know, to hear Jen reach out and say, let's come together. And so, uh, yeah, that's a little little history on myself and, and how we got involved with the coalition originally. Well, fantastic. You, I know you guys have been working really hard this summer on putting a lot of things together um, to, to get the survey launched for, for this fall. And um, I, I know there's a couple of things that are going to be launching here just in the next week. So if you will, go ahead and, and tell us, give us the update. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to go through this slide deck here to continue to kind of talk about the purpose and get to the Thriving Student Index, which is a survey that Wes just reference. Um, but again, to go back to, I guess, December, right? Jen reached out to us. And uh, in regards to where we're at as a coalition right now, we have uh, 26 operators now. So we started with an email chain of four operators. We're up to 26, which is absolutely incredible. And if you think about it, uh, especially a lot of you on the call, you may have had your own mental health initiatives that you've uh, been working on with your residents or your team members. Maybe you're thinking about starting them. What's been great is in the past, let's say, eight to nine months, you know, ourselves, ACC, Peak, uh, all these companies that are part of this coalition now, we're sharing our best practices. And so ACC has been a leader in the space, um, working with the Hi, How Are You project. And so shout out Gina Coward here. She's on the board of Hi, How Are You project and leads up marketing there at ACC. And she's been uh, instrumental in terms of uh, making sure that when we think of, okay, how do, how do we actually tackle this problem of improving the mental wellness of our residents, right? Uh, it really starts with figuring out where, where are they at? You're right. Like, like, like how, how can we go and start implementing programming and training if we don't, we don't know where they're at in the first place? And so, as you can see on the slide here, uh, and, and again, as Wes, as you mentioned, you know, we want to get a survey out to our combined portfolios. And so, really, you know, high level, it's, let's figure out where they're at. And then using those results, let's go and then implement the training and the programming. Because if we're going to help our residents out, we got to help our team members out. And that's something as we you know started discussing from December on to present day. Uh, you know that's been our goal and our, our objective. And so uh, you know to go through the slide deck, kind of already talked about the problem. I'll talk about the players a little bit. Shout out to everyone who's in the coalition and then uh, share with you kind of the plan going forward, what to expect, when to hear about these results and, you know, uh, when this change is happening. And so um, I don't need to read through these. I mean, like I, like I referenced earlier in the call, we all know that, you know, since COVID started, we've only seen a spike, especially in the 18 to 22 year old demographic. Um, so the problems in front of us, we all know about it. And, uh, you know, to move on to the players, you know, I just talked about the Hayahori project and uh, they've been awesome to work with. They got medical professionals on their board that have helped us opine on what's the best way to actually implement this research. Right. Because, you know, working, uh, you know, in this field, you know, we're not the experts. Right. We're not the experts in mental health, but we could be the facilitators to provide uh, life saving training and programs. And so. 
in regards to the coalition, uh, like I said, 26 and county members, uh, we got operators, uh, nearly 1 million beds. What I'm actually going to do here, Wes, I'm going to read through everyone just to give some kudos and good vibes. for Yeah, absolutely. Coalition. So we got ACC, we got Annex Group, Asset Living, Balfour Beatty, CA Student Living, Caliber Living, Campus Advantage, Campus Apartments, Campus Life and Style, Cardinal, Core, Dinnerstein, Graystar, Landmark, Michael Student Living, Peak, Pierce, Price, Redstone, Rise, RPM, Student Quarters, Scion, University Partners, and Yugo. So thank you to all of you from those companies that are on this call right now. Uh, can't wait to do transformational work for you. And I know we'll add people for uh, years to come here. Um, and so the third player in here, in addition to the 26 members in the high priority projects is Ipsos. And so Ipsos and ACC and high have partnered on doing their own internal survey the past a uh, handful of years. And so if you can imagine, we're taking their best practice and then, you know, sharing that with uh, all 26 of us. So it's, it's really amazing uh, to think of the opportunity here. And I guess to paint a picture for you all on this call today, um, you know, we've been talking to American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Jed Foundation, NAMI, all of these organizations that, you know, they have an arm of their business and mission to help college students and people in that 18 to 22 year old demographic. And, you know, just from talking to them, they're just so, so excited because it's been really hard to get in touch with that off campus demographic at mass. Right. Um, they've really only had data on, on campus students. Um, so it's which is really cool is it's never been done before um, to be able to collect almost a million uh, pieces of data. Right. And if we get between 10 and 15% of respondents, and our combined portfolio, I mean, that's an absolute win. And so uh, to move on finally to the uh, rollout plan here, um, here's a little timeline you all can read over, but to really sum it up, um, you know, we're gonna be down in Miami in a couple of weeks all together for one more final coordination meeting between that day and World Mental Health Day, which is October 10th. Um, really all 26 operators will be working on ensuring that our communication is streamlined and standardized. And on World Mental Health Day through the 31st of October, that survey is available for residents in our combined portfolios to take. And then in between the end of October through the new year, Ipsos will be working hard on aggregating and synthesizing that data. And then for you on this call, um, if you're an operator in the coalition, you'll be receiving your own individual report. In addition to seeing the national report, which we'll work with our PR groups on releasing in January. And then following that um, in the spring, that's when we're gonna reach out to Hi How Are You and AFSP and Jed Foundation and say, here's the data. Y'all are the professionals. What are the programs we can implement to train our team members? so that we have more conscious communities to be a safe haven uh, for our residents. And so I know I kept, I said transformational change on this call a couple of times, you know, really expect to start seeing that, you know, next academic year and, and forward as, you know, we really first, like I said, get that data and understand where, where are we at before we start making that change, we start innovating. And so, um, but yeah, that's the plan. We'll have to see if there's any questions in the chat. Wes is going to actually send this uh, presentation out in a PDF format so you all can take that home. Uh, yeah. Understand what's going on. Yeah, it's it's currently, you'll see it over in the uh, in the right-hand bar um, for you to download if you want to share this with your company or anybody else. There's another company out there, um, Richie, who is, you know, maybe just hearing this for the first time um, or, you know, maybe they're, a student housing property manager that's, you know, not necessarily with one of these big national groups, um, but they want their property to be involved. What's the best way for them to, to reach out and become part of the coalition? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I actually, before I answer that, we are, we are releasing a website soon. And so uh, uh, there'll be another way to access public information also to contact us. But what I'll do is I'll leave uh, my email uh, Casey Peterson's email, uh, Gina's and uh, uh, Jen's email in the chat here, and you can reach out to our group and uh, we can chat with you all and get you involved with the coalition. Fantastic. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. I do see a lot of um, uh, a lot of folks in the chat talking about it being an amazing initiative. Um, 
And and it is. I'm so I was so thrilled when Jim called me back in I guess it was uh, March April time frame. Um, you know, wanted to get everybody's emails together to to um, you know get interest in it. So it's it's fantastic seeing this come to fruition and uh, excited to to see the next steps. Awesome. Wes, thank you so much for having us. Seriously, really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll be on uh, soon again to share results and next steps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, guys, next I've got up Charlie Matthews here. And Richie, I will eject you here. Just give me a second. There we go. Ejected. That's a harsh word. <laughs> he's, doing uh, such nice, he's doing such good things. You're going to eject him. Come on now. <laughs> How are things going, Charlie? Ah, uh, we're, uh, we're at the mercy of Delta Airlines today. So I'm um, still at the hotel, but uh, excited to run through, um, you know, I guess where pre-leasing ended. We're, we're working on calling final occupancy. I was actually talking to some people in uh, Eugene this morning that are going through some move-ins. So once everyone's moved in, we'll put out the final occupancy numbers and uh, we'll, we'll run through those. Actually at NMHC here in a couple of weeks, Matthew and Dave were brave enough to let me um, or invite me to come join them uh, and, and speak a little bit, bit about things. Um, we also have a webinar uh, that following week, October 6th at 2 p.m., um, that we'll be running through a little bit of this stuff as well. Um, gotcha. and talking about some cool things happening with College House. But, um, no, things are good. Well, hey, I'll let you go ahead and, and get into it. I know that everybody's kind of anxious to see how the regions ended up this year. So, uh, for sure. if you've got if you've got control for the slideshow or if you need me to do it just uh, let me know. the button and it works so um we will get into the numbers here um so everything uh that we're going to be talking about pre-leasing rates this is all from the previous lease cycle um all of the data is relevant as to last friday so nine nine um that's when we essentially um charted our last pre-lease numbers if you will um, but nationally, the pre-leasing is, is at 92.5%, 92 which is up 1.17% year over year. Um, some context to that, last year, we had occupancy ending up at 91.19, so 91.2. So um, if things continue this trend, um, we should jump around here as it relates to, um, what's the best way to put this, um, you know, beginning of next week. Um, and Chris, I see your message in there. Final occupancy numbers will come out next week. We'll do a big release and share that around with our clients and, and, and post on the normal normal places in uh, in LinkedIn. Uh, but in the Northeast, um, pre-lease ended up roughly about 1.1% over um, where they were this time last year. The Midwest was at 92.1, up almost 2% there in the Midwest. Um, in the Southeast, sorry, my little here is... My face is covering up the thing on the market. Uh, pre the Southeast, roughly 92.9%, up roughly 1.6% from 2021. Um, in the Southwest, pre-lease is 93.1%. Um, in the pre-lease this time last year, is roughly 91.5%, so up about 1.6%. Um, and then pre-lease in the West is currently at 92%, up about 0.9%, uh, whereas at 91.1%. Excuse me. Um, and when we look at occupancy, so again, we're in this kind of transitionary phase, um, you know, final occupancy is moving in, whatnot. Um, again, we will call that next week and share that around um, and do continual uh, biweekly updates to finalize the occupancy once um, pre-leasing starts kicking off. Um, but if you see here, 2% above where the national occupancy was this time last year, um, again, people are moving in, more students. So Somewhere between that one and a half to 2% number is where I expect the occupancy to end up. And again, it was at 91.2 last year. So hopefully we'll get close to the 93% number um, as we, again, call the final numbers here um, and, and everybody has things updated um, starting tomorrow, but finalizing on Monday. So um, great things across the board. As we look at moving over to how this kind of moved, I think, um, you know, we have a couple little, I guess, event-driven macro um, little bubbles here that you can see on this chart. But what's most encouraging is especially with, um, if you look in the early um, October, November side, we, everything got off to a hot start, kind of leveled out again around the, around the new year um, and then really started taking off. So start early and then the late leasing that we've seen in markets um, across the United States has been pretty 
pretty wild to see. Um, you know, again, with the changes and, and you know, moving past COVID um, and the just the macro levels with, you know, the low, low new supply numbers. I know those are tickling trickling up um, as we look at the 23, 24 pipelines, but um, fundamentally student housing is, is back, you know, well above where it was, you know, two years ago um, from, from COVID. Um, moving over to our next slide, if we look at rates and you know, everybody sees the you know, multifamily and the conventional side, you know, some markets are at 18%, 22. I think Miami on one bedroom is like $4,000 on average, New York, highest level. I think one thing that we'll see this coming year, and the reason I wanted to bring up the slide is less to talk about what happened and more to talk about what's going to happen or, or what we foresee. Um, I think if you can, you know, as we look at markets and as we look at properties, I was on the phone today, you know, um, there's uh, with one of our clients, they've got properties that are almost 50% renewed and it's three weeks into, <laughs> into the new year. So um, as we look at this, I feel there's going to be some semblance with 4% rate growth year over year, um, a little bit more aggressive on rates. Um, fact that the, you know, there may not be any changes in demand. Enrollments are trickling back up, uh, but no new devs coming in. So um, as you look across the United States at, four at the five different regions here, um, the Southwest, Southeast, um, and the Northeast really showing the strongest from a, from a rate growth standpoint. And then the Midwest and the West, um, you know, roughly about two, two, two and a half percent there. Um, you know, looking ahead, um, I would imagine that these operators and, and these owners are going to be a little bit more aggressive um, to catch up to what the conventional market in, in the multifamily sector is has experienced. Um, I know cost is consideration of inflation. You know, you turn on the news, someone's talking about the world ending. So it'll be interesting to see how that's navigated, um, you know, on a, a national scale. But again, market by market, everything, you know, the playing field's a little different. So we should see, um, I'd, I'd say, a little bit more aggressive um, in, in where rates are headed um, from a portfolio level, from large to, you know, the individual property level, um, ensuring that, you know, they're, they're pushing the numbers for, for their investors, for their, for their teams. Um, and then the last slide on here is to talk to me. Um, you know, we have a couple of things with us. I'm going to get a little salesy here, but uh, we have a new platform, new version of the platform coming out in October. We're really excited about it. It brings in, being a relatively new company, it brings in the three years of data, um, sees all of the floor plan level data that we are, we're able to collect and shows you that in time series form. So um, a lot of good things happening with College House, a lot of good things happening with student housing. Um, and um, excited to share with everyone here over the coming week, um, final occupancies. Um, so you can go tell your investors to give you more money. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, you've, you've kind of shown me a preview of some of the things that are coming out with this next version, and I think it looks awesome. Um, and then, yeah, it, I'm excited about, you know, the fact that this, seeing what you guys have done over the past two years and, and now how we've got some good historical data in there. Um, it's, it's a platform that's evolving really well. Um, uh, see if there's any other questions. I did see something from, again, from Chris Richards in here. Um, of course, her other question was uh, kind of fi final occupancy numbers. Um, uh, yes. September. So, and she also asked about October. Yeah. So again, it's, with the different, I mean, every school is a little different. The reason why we haven't called it yet is because there are um, markets that still are pre-leasing and they're, you know, we got reported 22%. I don't think that's a final occupancy in some of these markets. So um, we'll start that process. And, and as you've seen our biweekly reporting, um, we'll start showing what the change, I mean, we track the occupancy and the pre-lease. So you'll see the data there. Um, if anybody has a question or wants to see anything um, in a little more detail, give me a buzz, um, but we're happy to help um, and continue to kind of be vocal and, and set the benchmark. Well, fantastic. Well, um, I don't see any other questions up here, and I know you're in the airport, so thanks so much for taking the time to join in, and we'll go ahead and get on to our next session. Thanks, Wes. Y'all be good. Thank you. Well, guys, we are, I'm pretty excited about the next thing that we're talking about. When I spoke with the committee back, the leadership committee back in, I guess it was, um, I guess it was August or right before August, it was in, in July. Uh, one of the topics they wanted us to highlight on, on Shop Talk and have some questions in regards to was 
what's happening with yield management, uh, specifically the yield management platforms. I think yield star is probably the most prominent one out there. And um, I, yeah, could we get some people that have been using it in student housing and talk to them about, you know, how it's helping them or how it's not helping them. <laughs> and I got introduced to two folks, um, Carrie and Peter, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Peter, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure. Audio okay on your end? You can hear? Sounds great. Perfect. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess unless you're on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Peter Iannone. I've been with uh, Campus Advantage for almost four years now, um, but I've been in the property management industry since 1994, with the first 10 years being in conventional. Um, prior to Campus Advantage, I was a Yield Star advisor for five years with RealPage. Uh, and currently, um, we have about 45 student assets, and about half of them are on active revenue management right now. Fantastic. Carrie? Great. Hi, I'm Carrie with Cardinal Group. I am the Revenue Management Director. Um, been with Cardinal for about a year and a half. Started here to help them build their Revenue Management Department. Prior to, I was over conventional for a very long time in revenue management and spent most of my career in multifamily property management, commercial real estate, commercial accounting, um, and also as a school teacher. So <laughs> kind of a very diverse background there. Um, anywho, yep, we uh, deployed Yield Star and revenue management at Cardinal about a year and a half ago and saw great success um, across our kind of pilot portfolio. So we're in the process of deploying it across, you know, the rest of our organization with a goal of having about 85% of ado adoption over the next couple of years. Well, fantastic. Well, you know, before we even get too far into the questions, and I do want to encourage everybody in, in the audience to, to ask questions to these panelists. They're very knowledgeable um, if you put it in the q and I'll be able to see it a little bit better. And then also, if you've got, uh, if you want to come on stage and, and ask them in person and, and have a conversation, um, uh, please, uh, please feel free to do that as well and raise the request to speak button. Um, but yeah, before we get started, because I know we've got a lot of folks in this audience that yeah, may not even know what yield management software is. So can we kind of talk about it from that just a, a general definition that you would you would give to someone who hasn't seen it before or worked with it before. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick that off. Um, yield management, revenue management is really just simply put maximizing revenues uh, through balancing rents and occupancy. I'm going to take it a step further and say um, leveraging revenue management strategies results in um, optimized revenues at a more granular level. Um, so what we're doing is digging into detailed floor plan and unit level trends, sometimes even at the amenity level, to dynamically price every opportunity in accordance with its demand trends. Um, and for us, I really want to make the distinction, um, there's really two components to revenue management, and that is the tool that you use, as well as the pricing advisor. And while you can revenue management re revenue manage with just a pricing advisor, albeit not scalable. Um, you can't revenue manage with just a tool. So the pricing advisor is a really important component to revenue management. They are the person that translates the data and helps build the strategies for the teams. Yeah, and I can add a little bit. I agree with all of that 100%. Um, yield management to me is is basically the revenue optimal balance between leasing velocity and, and rate growth so that you don't leave any money on the table, essentially. And I tell my site teams that, you know, in a perfect world, you take the very last lease for the season the day before move-in, which creates a lot of anxiety for them. But, you know, there's no extra credit for filling up in, in March. Um, and basically, you can't look at rate growth or leasing velocity in a vacuum. You know, alone, they're somewhat misleading metrics or can be misleading. Um, the only thing that anybody really cares about is how much money you're putting in the bank. And that's the marriage of rate and occupancy. Um, and on a tangent, you know, it's, it's looking at those data points in real time and making constant course corrections to adjust to a new um, you know, a new set of data versus just following a budget, which to me is a little more than just kind of a, a static roadmap. 
you know, what happens when you take the wrong exit or construction mm -hmm. has a, a road closed. And so I think when you talk about yield management, I focus more on the management than the yield because it implies kind of an active process versus a more passive one. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about where that data is coming from. Um, can you give us some background on, on the sources of that data? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. And again, every platform is going to have a different way that they handle data and, and where they get it from. Um, so it really depends on the system you're using. But generally, there are three ways that they accumulate data. Um, first and the most accurate data, uh, usually subscribers to a, a software platform um, allow their data to be logged and analyzed in aggregate. So you're not able to see any one property or any one competitor's data specifically, or else you'll have privacy issues and all that. Um, but as a result of getting that information kind of from the, from the source, you end up with really solid data right directly from the property management systems that are in place. Um, then if you know, you're, you're perhaps in a market that doesn't have good market penetration by the, uh, the software provider um, with clients or subscribers in the area, you'll often have um, the software provider themselves do some version of market surveys like the old fashioned uh, cold calling or scrubbing websites. Uh, and this is good supplemental information, but it's not always the most reliable. And, and more times than not, um, also a software provider will offer a, a third source of market data, which is user entered data from our end, which is entered from usually the site teams who are also doing market survey calls and, and scouring websites and doing secret shops and all that fun stuff. Um, those last two options are less reliable than data from a, a PMS system. So you really have to vet your information. And, and that's an important part of this process. You know, any computer program, garbage in, garbage out, it's only as good as what you feed it. Um, and while I like to have the breadth of data that most of these platforms provide, the key is to make sure that, you know, you're using relevant data. As with any statistical model, you need a good sample size to pull from. Otherwise, you have really volatile activity instead of nice, even trends. Um, and you might end up with 10 to 20 comps that are in a market that you can look at. But how many of them are you really competing with for the same prospects? Um, one criticism I have is that some of the solutions out there um, don't include new lease ups because they feel uh, that the way a brand new site leases up is is not a normal trend. They have huge marketing budgets and, you know, they're maybe trying to hit a pro forma that's very aggressive. So it's all about heads on beds and they can afford to lose rate the first year or whatever. Um, you know, whether that's a, that's a big okay. deal, that's it a is a huge deal. deal. And, and, you know, I've been working with revenue management software now for eight years. Um, and I'm shocked that for as many complaints as we've had about that, no one has, has really fixed it. Um, and whether you believe that you should, you know, follow a, a new lease up in the market or let them kind of do their thing year one, I mean, you can believe it or not, it's up to you. But those new assets can still be highly impactful forces in a market, especially depending on how competitively close you are to them with your product. Um, beyond yeah. that, I also feel like we compete a lot with on-campus inventory, especially our properties that are at a, a price point and have floor plans that are best suited for freshmen and sophomores. Um, and in those cases, we have absolutely no visibility into the dorms other than the data that we ourselves collect. And even then it can be hard to compare apples to apples with what's included in the dorms and you know the housing costs and stuff. Um, but I also think that that leaves a great opportunity for somebody to track what's happening on campus um, because, again, you know, uh, changes in dormitory inventory drastically affect us in some places from year to year. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think about we did a deep dive on Columbus, Ohio back in, in July, and I, there were I believe there were two or three. It's definitely it's definitely three it may have been actually four new purpose built assets and then there was also going to be i think there's two other kind of smaller um uh, you know convention well they were joint joint several leases but it, it, because of the location you know they're going to get students um mm -hmm. and not tracking that uh, that's that would be that would be tough so listen one of the main questions i wanted to ask you guys is you know because I, I understand how it works on the conventional side right um uh, that those things are, are changing every day. And I think this is, is a really great tool um, in, in the conventional 
field. But when we start talking about student and how, you know, we're kind of meeting weekly to discuss what's, you know, who's moving what, what concessions coming in, where, and we're looking at that. When you talk about a lease up, it's a lease up every year. And so you've also got to look at that velocity that everybody is, you know, is um, experiencing. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious, you know, is it a set it and forget it for you guys, or is this just one tool that's in the tool bag? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. Um, no, in conventional nor student should it ever be a set it and forget it. Um, it's a tool. It provides data um, that can always be flawed. So we will always heavily rely on the context and feedback from the site teams to really optimize the revenue management platform. Um, yeah, so. And I think for me, you know, on, on the way that we deploy it, you know, an important concept is having multiple tools and also uh, to not really lose the, the human side of it. Um, you know, like anything, diversity minimizes risk. And, and personally, I think AI is at this point in its infancy, a, a bit unreliable and, and perhaps a bit limited, um, you know, at least until we get to, to Skynet and Terminators roaming around. Um, but I, you know, I, I think it was Ronald Reagan that said, trust, but verify. And, and that's what I do. You know, I, I love the data, but I always verify it through other means. Um, for instance, I might have a property that has a housing fair every February. And so the model counts on a certain amount of demand from that property each year in February. Well, what if the university decides to, to move that housing fair to March this year? We know it's not a loss of demand, simply a deferment of demand by a month. But the model thinks you fell short of what you normally get every February and potentially starts pulling back on your rates, which is the wrong thing to do. So I think you need a human mind to interpret the data and, and recommendations, um, which is why we have, like you said, the weekly calls with the site teams, the boots on the ground. Um, but more than that, I think successful revenue management doesn't even really start with with pricing. Price should be your last attempt to change velocity or to, to do a course correction. Um, it's the property management 101 stuff. I mean, I can tell you what a rate or I can tell you what rate a market can bear for like a four bedroom, but if you have terrible curb appeal and, and a site team that um, doesn't know how to close a lease and brand management and reputation issues, my data and pricing guidance is, is worthless. No matter how much tech you use or how you use it, you still need to revert back to the fundamentals. And I think some people see the shiny new thing, you know, uh, you know, revenue management software tool, and they go all in. And really, it's got to be just one tool in your toolbox, and you have to do all the interpretation that comes with that. So uh, I think a important question that, that's on everyone's mind, and I've got some good questions that are coming in. I can't wait to get to them, but are there student markets, certain student markets that this works better in than others? Um, I'll, I'll speak to that um, first, I guess. For, for me, I know Peter has a slightly different answer here, um, but for me, it's more relative to the subject property and less so to the market. Albeit, like Peter described earlier, it's just most of our statistical models. Um, so the more data you have, the better the recommendations are going to be. So if you're in a market that has lots of communities with similar floor plans, you're gonna have a better sample set versus, you know, we have a market that has one competitor in the entire market. So we don't have great market data there, but provided the subject property has ample historical data to track to and measure seasonal demand by unit type, uh, the tool can work for you, even in that limited market. So. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a, a very important point is having the history there and, and you know having some solid trends that you can pull from. So again, I agree 100% there. Um, you know, on, on my end, you know, across you know um, two employers, I guess you can say I've made revenue management systems work in just about every market. Um, but obviously, some are more uh, labor intensive and, and require more interpretation of the data and more deviation from from recommendations. Um, the markets that I've had the most success in are the ones that are fairly homogenous. Um, I think I used the word monolithic before and, and confused some folks. But and what I mean by that, in, in the sense that most of the product around you is, is very similar to you. 
um, the markets that are the most labor, uh, labor intensive for me are the ones where you're maybe an older B class property a mile from campus. You've got maybe two class A purpose built, highly amenitized properties right on the border of campus. Maybe a you know a brand new lease up happening, uh, and then you have kind of that shadow market behind you of single family homes and some mom and pop fourplexes. And it's really hard to compare apples to apples when you have that diversity of options in the marketplace. Um, more than that, markets with the whole range of operators who may have no idea what revenue management is and undermine the integrity of the whole market's rates. Um, those are the markets I dread. Um, plus, you have to look at yourself and, and what your business model is. You know, Are you the only by-the-bed property in an older market that's still mostly conventional assets, leasing joint and several to students? Um, that's where I see the most struggle getting your own rates dialed in just right is, is where you just have this very big diversity of product, very big diversity of uh, management style and, and those things. Well, fantastic. Um, by the way, Rob Myers says that um, he, for one, welcomes the new robot <laughs> overlords. So. Well, we got to find John Connor to, to stop it. But uh, anyway. By the way, Rob, Rob has a great student housing blog. Uh, Rob, if you want to put it up in the in the chat, but um, I love some of his <laughs> – some of the, his thoughts on things. It's, it's fantastic. Well, I, you know, the last question I've got before we get to the audience questions is, you know, is there, is there a place where yield management is helping you guys, at, you know, outside of, um, you know, just setting rates? Is it helping with business development? Is it helping with, you know, advising a university, um, uh, you know, if they've engaged you as, a, as an advisor? Um, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah I can probably start. Um, oh, go ahead, Carrie. Go ahead. Sorry, Peter. Um, no, go ahead. Just for us, you know, absolutely. It's not just setting rate, but if we can't achieve the rate that we should be able to based on the market dynamics, our position within it, it's helping us to suss out operational opportunities, including pipeline opportunities, lead follow-up product presentation. Do we need to adjust our screening criteria and qualifications in this market because of, you know, the mass fallout of uh, applications being denied, right? So, you know, those are the things that we further dig into when we can't make sense of performance in a market relative to rate. Gotcha. Go ahead, Peter. I, oh, I did just okay. bring up Jen Frazier because she's got a question, but I'll, yeah. uh, I'll go ahead and let you finish that up, Peter. <laughs> sure. And, uh, you know, and first on my end, I don't want to imply that there is this robust surplus of data coming from some of these systems that, you know, can be broadly applied to other areas of our, our work. But um, specifically, you know, revenue management software is great for an outward look at the market. Um, but so much of, of we, uh, so much of what we do requires us to kind of turn in and kind of look at ourselves. And so business intelligence tools and performance analytic tools are important to us to look at, you know, KPIs within, within our own little sphere. Um, and when we have those weekly calls, you know, we're not just talking about the market and where we are relative to everybody else. We're talking about, you know, customer service scores and all these other things that are really a part of the value that you create, which in turn dictates um, the, the rates you can charge. Um, you know, I can tell you, you know, what rent a market can bear, but if you have 200 outstanding work orders two weeks after moving, customer service issues and declining reputation in the community, you know, I'm not going to see that from a yield management solution until it's too late. Um, so in that way, I think data is actually lacking a little bit unless you subscribe to a whole suite of products. All that being said, to answer the actual question, um, I think there is some, some limited application beyond pricing to the data that we get. Um, for starters, I think it helps you better understand how inventory is absorbed in a market. Um, you know, maybe there's 1,500 new beds uh, coming online. Ouch. Um, or, or maybe there's uh, an enrollment increase of 2,000 new freshmen. You know, hooray. Well, how do those play off each other and what kind of absorption is there and, and how is it all affecting rates in the market? Um, additionally, I think it can give you some insight into markets that are you know, speeding up or slowing down. So speaking to asset strategy, is this an asset you know, that we want to hold on to a little bit longer or do we want to prepare it for disposition? Um, you know, when is our ROI starting to plateau on things? So I think all of those things in terms of you know, new business development, 
um, you know, you can find assets in a market that are struggling operationally. And maybe that's a cue for you to pick up another asset in the market and do some value add and, and hopefully do it without cannibalizing an existing asset in that market. So I think there is some some stuff you can pull out of that um, as it relates to universities. I don't know if we asked that question, but um, I, I don't think we really have a lot of data to deal with universities. I think there's kind of a bit of a firewall between the private sector and universities still. So I don't know that we have much use for those relationships. So, Gotcha. Well, we've been joined here by Jennifer Frazier <laughs> at Graystar. Jennifer, hey, everyone. You got a question? Yes. Yes. Hello, everyone. Sorry. I think I entered the room a little too soon. Apologies there. Um, hey, Carrie. Uh, hey, Peter. Peter just goes on and on. That's the <laughs> <laughs> You knew this going into it. You knew this going into it. <laughs> no problem. Well, I'm interested in hearing a little more regarding your standard operating procedures when um, you have a, um, a daily rate that's recommended and it's, you know, you may not agree with that rate. What is your standard process with that? And um, a couple of other things. Um, and, uh, and also kind of your average, if it's daily or weekly that you're looking at this, what is that acceptance rate? So is it is it 20 percent? Do you accept 80 percent? What's that process there? And then lastly, one other question I had, um, how much of your rent growth do you attribute to using this tool, this revenue management tool? Yeah, great questions. And I'll tackle the rate acceptance one um, for conventional, uh, you know, you would target 75 to 85 percent is what we strive for. Student, um, hard to answer this question without getting super technical in the explanation as to why, but there is not a rate acceptance percentage threshold because, try to keep it high level, um, <laughs> because you are tracking to lease applications, which in student stay in the pipeline for a much longer period of time. So yield starts recommending increases based off those lease applications, whereas we're, we are moving rate based on full lease execution. So that's one component of it. The frequency with which we can change rate is limited because the API for Yield Star specifically is what we're using right now. And our property management system, there isn't one. So those rates don't feed back into the system. And there are some administrative processes that are a bit cumbersome um, when it comes to changing rate more frequently wow. that limit our ability to do so. Um, so those are the two primary reasons, like from a process perspective, that we're gonna see lower rate acceptance in student. Um, but on average, you know, again, this is kind of like our pilot year. On average, we were kind of around the 25% acceptance rate at the beginning of the season. And then as we kind of ramped up, stabilized and filled our inventory, people got a little more aggressive and comfortable with testing higher rates. So we, on average, were closer to maybe like that 40% acceptance rate. Okay. Um, I would not set those as benchmarks or thresholds or targets by any means because there are so many nuances and processes in certain markets and the setup of a community that would, um, you know, prevent you from from hitting those targets. So, Do you um, set up those um, thresholds per property? No, we don't. We don't have a rate acceptance target for our student properties. But when we're evaluating history, oops, sorry, you cut out there. Oh, sorry. Do you um, do you typically set those benchmarks per property or per market? So you could say, you know, hey, we have more history on this property, so we we will probably get a more of like a forty or fifty percent, um, you know, ratio versus the twenty. No, we do not set a rate acceptance target for a student. Um, okay. Not at all. It, it, no, not at all. It would not be my market and the history doesn't necessarily impact that. It's more the processes around lease application, lease execution, frequency of rate acceptance is what's going to okay. impact that. Yeah. And then and your second question was... What was your second question? Uh, the, the, accept, the acceptance rate was the second question. And then my other was, um, how much of your uh, rent growth do you attribute to using this this particular tool, this revenue management tool? Yeah, we expect to see a 1% to 3% outperformance to market in, in revenue. Um, however, year one, we far exceeded that, um, okay. which you can expect because it helps you kind of establish your, your position in the market. It's like, oh, when we were doing manual rates, we perceived ourselves, you know, down here on the lower end, but the market perceived us up here. So mm -hmm. 
we experienced a, a lot of rate growth the first year. And then the second year, you may make that up on renewals. So year three, I expect that to, to normalize more so. And I, I would see kind of, you know, expect to see around that one to 3% outperformance to market and revenue. Okay. Got it. Gotcha. Jennifer, thanks so much. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple other questions here that uh, I want to get to. Uh, one from Brad Hastings at Walt to Campus. Uh, what is the most important data to use for yield management? And I think this next question is actually his real question. Is there, is there data uh, that you can't get today that you wish you had access to? I, I would love to speak to that. Um, I would love to have university enrollment numbers. I would love to track lease executions through the tool um, compared to those lease applications I was just speaking to. And conventional, it makes sense. And student, it's a little bit different because it, you know, the pipeline is different. Um, and then uh, I think there was one other thing that I was really had on my wish list. Uh, Peter, I know you had some feedback on that one as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I discussed it a little bit in the sense that, you know, a lot of the university statistics sense that as our core audience, um, a lot of that data is just either not available or just not being tracked. So I would like to see more insight into that. Um, and also, you know, some functionality that, and this is maybe what, what she's saying is, um, you know, looking at inventory changes. So from one year to the next, you know, whether it's a new lease up or a dorm being taken offline, better understanding um, of how you know, the new beds are going to impact the big picture for better or for worse. And so, yeah, there's a few things I'd like to see, but again, a lot of the stuff that we do, um, we talk through it. And, and so those questions are answered maybe through a different non-mechanical format. But, um, you know, for me, the most important data is, you know, are we uh, as a percentage keeping up with the rest of the market? You know, if, is the rest of the market 50% and we're 65? Well, then we're leaving money on the table. Is the rest of the market 50 and we're 45? Uh, maybe we're being too aggressive. So I feel like as long as everybody is kind of moving up as a group um, and, and we're not going to be the first one to lease up, that's the most important for me. Gotcha. Well, we've just been joined by Caitlin Hanks, but Caitlin, before you ask your question, there was one that I just put up um, from... Whitney Kidd, let me just read this again. Have you converted to the new AIRM platform with RealPage, or are you still using Legacy Yield Store? Um, ARM is not, la the last meeting we had, ARM is not ready for student yet. Um, we have converted to ARM on some of, our, some of our conventional communities, but not ready for student. Yeah, we're on Yield Store. I I, I call legacy when I was there eight years ago. I think we're on Yieldstar version two or whatever they're calling it these days. Yeah, but yeah, we're not. Yeah, we're not. We're not on the new stuff yet. Gotcha. Thanks for that question, Whitney. Caitlin. Hey, guys. Um, my question is for properties that are utilizing a revenue management tool and pricing advisor. Um, I'm curious how students and their parents are responding to the rate changes at a potentially much faster pace through revenue management software prompts versus a traditional um, tiered approach? And is this driving a greater sense of urgency to sign their leases sooner since there isn't an ability to see lease, lease rates um, availability countdowns? Yeah, great question. Sure. We experienced the unexpected, we expected to see slower velocity with holding rates and pushing rates higher. But what we saw is we actually exceeded our pre-leasing goals at a much more rapid rate because of that sense of urgency created around the frequency of rate changes. Um, so great question. And for me, I mean, I know, again, I keep kind of getting away from the technology and going back to the, to the people. But, you know, I think at this point, most of the population understands revenue management, if only from the sense that, you know, they're subject to it everywhere else, the hotel industry, the airline industry, the uh, the rental car industry. So that alone creates the sense of urgency or the, the fear of missing out. Um, whether or not it drives a greater sense of urgency is really up to you. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you're using good um, revenue management uh, behavior, making sound pricing decisions, you, you pace yourself so that your prices earlier in the season are always cheaper than the prices at the end of the season. And if you do that consistently, you reinforce the concept of sign early for the best deal. If you fail to do that um, and start panicking at the end of the season and throwing out $500 gift cards, you train your people 
well, they don't know what they're doing. Wait till the last minute and you're going to get the best deal. So really how effectively you do revenue management determines the level of urgency and, and, and the precedence that you set. Great. I think we'll end up, uh, we'll end the questions there. Thank, thank you guys so much, uh, Carrie and Peter for, for joining today. I know that this is a, this is going to continue to be a, a hot topic. We've got some other players coming into, um, you know, into the same space and looking forward to, you know, how that's going to mix things up as well. So um, I do have a couple of just quick announcements. Uh, one, I spoke to our friends over at, um, uh, over at Student House of Business yesterday and LeaseCon TurnCon has been, uh, sorry, all the pictures are in the way here, but, um, LeaseCon TurnCon has been planned for December 7th, and it's going to be here in Charlotte, uh, which is fantastic. I actually won't have to fly for this conference. So, um, And then also just the – wanted to make sure everybody is aware, the next um, Shop Talk is scheduled for Tuesday, October 11th. So that's it today, guys. I appreciate everyone uh, who attended, and thanks to all of our guests. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Peter. Wes. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, everybody.